Good morning, Cross Point. Thank you for being with us this morning. If you could please stand with us and worship. In the middle 
and welcome to church this morning. My name is Micah. I'm one of the members of the staff here at Cross Point. We want to make sure you feel welcome for those that are in the room and for those of you that might be watching online this morning. Here at Cross Point, we exist to point people to Jesus and to inspire them to live the cross-shaped life. We do this through four major areas. Number one, through worship, both in the home and at church. We do this through discipleship, through which, uh, intentionally investing in small groups. We do this through serving, not only in our church, but also in our neighborhoods and in our communities. And lastly, we also do this through sending. We believe that we don't just want to send you uh, around the world, but we also want to send you in your neighborhoods, in your places of work, and even in our schools. And so as we begin to worship this morning, I want to make a mention of one new change to our service this morning. Preschool is open for the first time in quite some time. You can give a round of applause for that. So if you have a, a kid that is anywhere from birth to pre-kindergarten and you would like to take them to preschool, it's to my left, to your right, down those steps, and they will take care of it uh, down there for you. Otherwise, if you can keep them in the service, that is totally up to you, and that is perfectly acceptable. The last thing I'll mention is our app. If you have not gotten a chance to download our app, uh, there's going to be a website you can go to come up on the screen. It's crosspointchurch.com slash app. And if you will go there and download that, I love it because it's got uh, the worship guides. You know, uh, after COVID now, we don't uh, hand out any worship guides. That is on the app that you can just pull up really quick. I love it because I can uh, open it up and I can follow Doc's message on there. He's got his sermon notes uploaded, and it's an awesome feature uh, for you to use. So before we continue uh, worshiping this morning, I want to call Dr. Merritt up to the stage, and uh, he's going to have a few words for us uh, with this upcoming week. Doc? Yeah, thank you, Micah. And uh, just stay up here with me. Mike does such a great job. Hey, two things real quick. I want to just piggyback on what he said. How many of you, I mean, you're going to think this is funny, how many of you, came to church in a horse and buggy this morning. Just raise your hand, anybody out there? Okay, you don't. Okay. So, take seriously what he said about the app. I know some people say, I'm not going to do the app. This is the 21st century. The horse and buggy days are over. If you've got a cell phone, you should know how to put on an app. And, and it's to your advantage because everything you'd want to know about our church, all that's going on, again, you've got all the sermon notes. So in other words, when you've got the sermon notes, you fill those out, you keep that in your phone forever. And there may be a sermon that I preach down the road, and you say, man, what was the pastor said about that? Or what was that? And it'll all be on your phone. So I really want to encourage you to download our, our church app. The other thing I want to talk about is, is the big elephant, not just in the room, the big elephant in the country is, you may or may not know this, you've been asleep for 30 years, but we have an election on Tuesday. And uh, how many of you are going to vote on Tuesday? Let me just see your hand. Let's see how many are going to be good citizens. How many of you have already voted? Oh, good. Okay. So, all right, good. So have I. Okay. Now, let me just say this to our church. We do, we do something. We've done it every year since we started this church. We're going to pray tonight, today, for the election and for God's will to be done. And then, you need to know, we do this every single time a president's elected. We don't care who it is. We will get on our knees next Sunday, and we will pray for the president-elect. Now, I want you to hear me clearly. You say, well, I hope this guy doesn't get elected. I don't like that guy. I hope the other guy doesn't. I don't like that guy. I get it. I understand that. And this is the most polarizing election I've been in in my lifetime. And there's so much hostility and so much anger out there, and you're just afraid to even talk about it. But that's not the way we handle it in here because we're believers, we're Christians, and we're commanded to pray for our leaders. It's not a requirement. It's a request. It's a requirement. And that's what we do. So I just want to prepare you next week for whoever gets elected, and we don't know who that's for. We may not even, by the way, we may not know next Sunday, so we won't pray then. But we finally find out who's elected. We're going to pray for them. doesn't matter who it is. Last thing is this. I want to encourage you one more time. Don't make the political personal. You have a right to vote. We got people in this church going to vote for Biden. We got people in this church going to vote for Trump. We got people in this church not going to vote for either one. The thing you need to keep in mind, I don't have to answer for the way you vote. You don't have to answer for the way I vote. We're not going to make it personal. Because more important than anybody gets elected is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. So let the world get out there and fight and curse and get angry and throw things about all this election stuff. Folks, at the end of the day, without God, we're sunk. It doesn't matter who gets elected. It's irrelevant. So I want us to pray. I want us to pray right now. Let's pray for uh, the election. Let's pray for God's perfect will to be done. And then at the end of the day, no matter who's elected, listen carefully, I'm going to be done. You may not be happy with who's elected. That's okay. 
But the joy of the Lord is our strength. I don't take joy in a candidate. I take joy in our Lord. So let's pray together. Lord, in the name of Jesus, uh, it's a contentious time in our nation. And I was just reading in my quiet time this morning how pleasant and wonderful it is when brethren dwell together in unity. Lord, we're going to set an example in our church. We can walk out of here and we can disagree. We can walk out of here and we may not like the way our friend voted or like the way our neighbor voted. But at the end of the day, Lord, the most important vote that counts is our vote for the gospel and our vote for Jesus and our vote for love and our vote for unity. That's the vote that we're casting in our church. So we just, again, pray that your will will be done. And no matter who's elected this week or this coming week, no matter what the final results are going to be, we're going to praise you. We're going to thank you. We're going to adore you. We're going to worship you. We're going to show an unbelieving world. This is how Christians respond. And this is how Christians act. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's stand together. Let's worship the Lord together. I love this. No matter where you find yourself in this room or at home, wherever you are, the church is without walls. The church lives in us. God has been so good to us. The fact that we're here, that we're alive, is a testimony of our great God. So come on, let's sing to him. Come on. Oh, yeah. Think about it. We'll see what our Savior has done and see how his love overcomes. He has done great things. Thank you, Lord. He has done great things. Yeah, we sing. Oh,
and kind and full of mercy like our God. And he's worthy of all of our praise. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Heaven's mercy. 
got to sing it one more time. Sing holy, holy. Good morning, Cross Point. I want to introduce you to this guy right here. This is Misha Felton. Um, he's got an interesting past. He was born in the Ukraine. Before being adopted at the age of five, he spent time in an orphanage. Uh, I, I, I'm reminded of James talking about taking care of widows and orphans. And the people who, who adopted him took care of an orphan. And he was raised in, in America in a Christian home. And he, he says that in middle school, he went to church with a friend and felt like the sermon was for him. And that day, he placed his faith in Jesus Christ in middle school. Um, the difference between before and after, he said, I, I just wasn't satisfied. Nothing was fulfilling in my life. And after Christ, he goes, I've got fulfillment. I have peace, and I know that I'll spend an eternity in heaven. What, a, what an awesome testimony. I mean, to, to be raised before the age of five as an orphan, to be adopted, and now be adopted by God as a son. Isn't that fantastic? It's amazing. So I, I, wanna, I want you as a church family to commit to praying for him. Uh, here in the next few weeks, he's getting married. His fiance is right here. Fantastic. But after that, he's going to basic. He's going to join the Marines. So pray for him, please. He's going to be a pilot. How cool is that? He's going to fly planes. So thank you for your commitment to serve. Thank you for coming today to publicly profess your faith in Jesus. So, Misha, Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. What is your profession of faith today? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. That's fantastic, brother. Fantastic. <laughs> Based upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ and in obedience to God's word, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We love to celebrate life change at Cross Point, and it's so great to be able to share this experience, not only with you that are here in the room, but also with those who are watching with us online. Because baptism is your public testimony of your faith in Jesus Christ. So it's great to be able to share that with Misha today as he begins his journey with the uh, armed forces to serve as a pilot in training. You know, today uh, we have the opportunity to give to the Lord as we do every week. And the reason we give is because God has been gracious already to us. You know, 2 Corinthians 9, 11 says, When you give to the Lord, you will be enriched in every way and on every occasion. What an opportunity to enrich someone else's life because we've been enriched by God. We have several ways to give at Cross Point. You can give on our website. You can go to crosspointchurch.com slash giving. You can also give through text giving. And the number is 678-582-81. Eight zero, And then you can also give through our app. There's a place there you can do that as well. And then finally, for those of you that are here on the campus today, you can give through one of our giving centers that are located around the room and in the lobby. And it's because of your faithfulness and because of your faithful giving to the Lord through Crosspoint that we're able to do the ministries that we do week in and week out. And I don't want to say thank you. As we move into this special time of the year, which we call our giving season, you know, we're thinking about others. Today, I want to ask you as you're giving to think about the Lord Jesus and think about what he's done in your life and what he's done for you and through you. And thank God for his faithfulness to love us unconditionally. This morning, let's pray as we begin to take this time to give in our worship service. Heavenly Father, 
we celebrate with Misha today for his decision to follow Jesus Christ. We also, God, celebrate the fact that every day is a new day with you and all of the opportunities you've given us through your word, you tell us that we can be enriched in every way because of our generous giving. So we give to you freely today because we love you most of all and because you have provided for us and through us, secondly. Father, thank you for our church. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for those for watch us week in and week out and those who give faithfully each week to support the ministries of Cross Point. We thank you for their generosity and we thank you for meeting their needs. God, we also pray today for those who are still suffering through COVID. We pray for those who are sick today, those who want to be here in person but are not ready yet, God, to be close proximity with other people. Thank you for those that are here and for their willingness to uh, just come and gather with other believers to worship you in person. We love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to say good morning. I want to welcome those who are watching us online and those who are here in our building this morning. Uh, before I get started, just real quick, how many of you are married? Okay. And how many of you have a perfect marriage? Okay. All right. Then you don't need to hear what I'm about to say, but if you're one of those like me that don't, um, I'm, I've been asked to do this for years, and so we're going to do something uh, next March in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Uh, Teresa and I are going to be leading a marriage retreat. We're calling it Reignite. And what I have found in all honesty, even the best of marriages have difficulties and things they have to work through. And we've been spending 44 plus years doing that. And so God has taught us a great deal about how not to have just a good marriage, but a great marriage. I have a great marriage, not a perfect marriage because she's married to me. That's the big problem. But uh, we have learned through the years ways to work through every kind of difficulty, the sexual difficulty, the financial difficulty, the communicating difficulty. And so we're going to be, if you, if you have any interest at all, you can go to crosspointchurch.com forward slash reignite, or you can go to touchinglives.org and you can get information. There will be next March, God willing, uh, we'll be meeting in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. We're going to limit it to about 200 couples. And we're well on our way to that. But I wanted to let you know, and so you could, uh, if you'd like to be a part of that, you can go check out the information. If you've got somebody you know that has a marriage that could need it or use it, uh, you could do that as well. And we're looking forward to pouring our lives into, into couples because I'm, I'm a big believer in marriage. I'm a big believer in the family, and I want to help families to have the kind of families and marriages that they ought to have. So I want to be transparent today. One of my former churches had a deacon. And from the time I became the pastor of that church, he disliked me. Uh, I knew it the moment I met him. His, in fact, his wife was on the pastor's church committee that called me. And the first time we met, and I won't tell you why, but it was obvious through some things he said, I told Teresa, I said, this guy didn't like me. I don't know why, but he doesn't like me. It was obvious. And it became very obvious because from the time I became the pastor of that church, for all, I was there for almost two years, a little over two years, he was critical of every single thing I did and made a point to let me know it. Didn't, didn't matter what I did. Any new idea was a bad idea. Uh, any action I took, we've never done it that way before. Now, the interesting thing is, in the two years I pastored that church, our congregation had an incredible impact. 
People were saved every single week. We, we went through a season of time when people were being saved at Wednesday night prayer meeting. If you remember what a Wednesday night prayer meeting was, we had people saved on Wednesday night prayer meeting. We were the fastest growing church in town. We broke the record for the most baptisms in the state of Mississippi two years in a row. I mean, God was moving in an unbelievable way, but it didn't matter what happened. It didn't matter, it matter, it matter how much we celebrated every changed life. Nothing seemed to please this guy. So it all came to a head on a deacon's meeting we were having Sunday afternoon. It was, the, it was actually the uh, Sunday before Christmas. And everybody's in a festive mood, and, and we were going out to the shut-ins in our church that couldn't come to church, and we were going to serve the Lord's Supper. When we were sitting in a room, there were about, I guess, about 25 deacons in the room. We're sitting in this square room, and he's sitting across the room from me. And um, just out of the blue, I don't even know, remember what the issue was about, but he was just kind of, you know, minor nitpicking things. And I mean, he lit into me. I mean, he lit into me. He let me have it with everything that he had for probably four minutes. I mean, I can't, I can't remember all of it, but I'm telling you, he, he had had enough of me. Well, I grew angry with every word he said. I'm, I'm just being very transparent. And um, when he got through, you could tell every other dick in the room was looking for the door. They just wanted to get out of the room. And so um, there was an awkward silence, and everybody's kind of looking for it. Nobody knew what to say. And I got up, and I walked over to him, and I got right in front of him. And with all the love I could muster, which wasn't a lot, I said, Jim, I've had it with you. I said, all you've done since I've been here is gripe, criticize, and complain. It doesn't matter to you that people are being saved. It doesn't matter to you that the Word of God is being preached. It doesn't matter to you that God is moving in a tremendous way. I said, all you care about is your own agenda. All you care about is gripe and nitpick and complain and moan and groan, and you pick apart everything we try to do. So I said, let me just say this to you, and I said, if you don't ever believe another word I say, I want you to believe what I'm about to tell you. And I bent down, and I said, if you ever Say another word, another negative word to me while I'm pastor of this church. One of us is going to be leaving this church, and it's not going to be me, and there are plenty of other churches in town, and I'll help you find one. We got along great after that. It kind of went, you know, everything kind of changed. Now, you can say I was wrong in what I did, and I'm not sitting here and telling you it was the best moment I've ever had in ministry, but can we just be honest? You ever had a moment like that? Hey, something like that ever happened to you? Can you ever remember a time when a person mistreated you or they mistreated a loved one and their behavior, you, finally you just had all you could take and there's something they said or something they did sparked anger in you and it, it was like striking flint on kindling? So yeah, I've been there. Well, let me give you some good news. Something similar like that happened to Jesus, believe it or not. Yeah, Jesus. Something similar just like that. If you're joining us today, we're in a series called Seeing Red. What we're doing is studying those times in Jesus' life when, yes, even Jesus got angry, when even Jesus got in somebody's face, when even Jesus got upset. And there were several times. And today we're going to look in the third chapter of the Gospel of Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are four Gospels. In the third Gospel, in the second Gospel, the third chapter, we're going to look at one of those things that, I mean, this, what happened gave Jesus heartburn. I mean, it lit his fuse. It caused him to give his arch enemies, the Pharisees, a big stink eye. I'm just telling you, he was hot. And I particularly want those of us who, and this is some of us in the room, most of us, we're religious, we're church going, you're here. We try to dot the religious eyes, we try to cross the religious tree, tees. I want you to listen very carefully to this story. Because what you're going to see today is a group of religious people who thought they were close to God. They thought they and God were just like that, but they weren't even in the same zip code. I read a story, I don't know if it's true or not, but I read a story about a member of a skydiving club, and he volunteered to videotape a jump. Well, he was the first one in the club to jump, and he turned the camera on everybody else, and they were all floating together, and they finally they joined hands to complete their free-falling circle. And then he taped them one by one as they began to pull their rib cords. They began to float in the air. Well, suddenly the image blurs, and the camera begins to swing wildly about because it was at that exact moment that the cameraman realized he had forgotten his parachute. 
So intent was he on preparing the camera and planning the filming, he had neglected the most important thing. In other words, on the outside, it looked like he was a member of the same club that everybody else was a member of, but he didn't have what they had, and it cost him his life. And that's kind of where these Pharisees were. And you don't want to wind up like these Pharisees, and you don't want to wind up thinking you're on the inside looking out when you're really on the outside looking in. We're going to learn today there are, that there are three mistakes you better avoid if you're going to know God in the way you ought to know God. And we, some of us have been guilty some of these times, including me. So get ready. Number one, don't ever prioritize religion over God. Don't ever prioritize religion over God. Now, it's important to notice when and where this story took place. We're in Mark chapter 3, verse 1. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Now, let me set this story up. I love this story because I've been to Capernaum. This is in Capernaum. This was kind of Jesus' home away from home, kind of his headquarters and his ministry. We go there every year. We, every time I go to Israel, we go there. And, 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 and so this is the synagogue that's in Capernaum. If you ever get to go to Israel, by the way, we actually go to a fourth century, the ruins of a fourth century synagogue that was built over the exact place where this synagogue stood. So it's one of those unique places you get to go. Well, here's Jesus in the synagogue. The reason why he's in the synagogue is because it was the Sabbath day. And that's when observant Jews went to their church and attended religious services. So in other words, get the picture. Jesus is in the right place. He's there at the right time. And he's there for the right reason. Because it was God's day. And so on God's day, he's in God's house to hear God's words word and to worship God with God's people. And that's the way it ought to be. Because God's day is to be a time of restoration. God's house is to be a place of rejuvenation. God's word is to be a message of regeneration. And that's exactly why the man with the withered hand was there. He was looking for hope. He was looking for help. He was looking for healing. Well, where else should you go when you need hope? Where else should you go when you need help? Where else should you go when you need healing? You ought to be in God's house on God's day in God, with God's people believing you will find God. I pray that's why you're here today. I hope you didn't just come in, you know, out of guilt or just kind of checking off your religious box. I'm going to assume the best of you. Hey, I did come to God's house on God's day to worship with God's people and to hear God's Word. That's great. But some of the Pharisees that's not why they came to church that day. Here's why they came. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, just like my deacon buddy Jim, always looking for a reason to criticize. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closer to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. So get the picture. They weren't there to find God. They were there to find fault. They were there to catch Jesus doing something they didn't like. They couldn't see God with a telescope, but they had Jesus under a microscope. By the way, in the Greek word, the word for watching indicates this is what they did all the time. Every time they got around Jesus, they didn't care what truth he was speaking. They didn't care if what he said could change their life. All they wanted to do was say, let's catch you doing something wrong. They were always looking for Jesus to mess up, to foul up, to make a mistake. And by the way, that's what modern day Pharisees do even now. So what do you mean? You ever heard the word legalism? I want you to understand something. We, there are legalists in churches today. It's one of the things that turn non-religious people off. Legalism is when you turn your personal preferences into divine principles. Or to put it another way, you judge people by whether or not they live up to your standards. Not God's, yours. You've got certain standards. You've got certain preferences. You've got certain things you think people ought to do, ought to say, the way they ought to dress, the way they ought to look. So that's the way you kind of, we kind of judge people. So in other words, another way of putting it is legalists put preferences above truth. They equate what they think with what God says. And what a legalist is, is this. It's when we put what we think people ought to do above and ahead what God says they ought to do or not do. I'm going to give you a classic example. The Bible clearly forbids drunkenness. Everybody agrees with that, right? Wrong to get drunk. The Bible clearly forbids drunkenness. However, 
The Bible does not require abstinence. It condemns drunkenness. It doesn't require abstinence. Now, to be clear, those of you who know me know this. I don't drink. I've never had a drink. I'm never going to have a drink. And I believe I could build, if you want me to, a biblical case, a good case why I think it's probably better for Christians not to drink. However, let me make this very, very plain. I don't condemn people who drink. I don't judge people who drink. It doesn't bother me when people drink. I've got some of my best friends have wine cellars in their house, and they drink. Some of the best people we have in this church drink. I don't judge them. I don't condemn them. Some of my closest friends do it. And here's what I've learned. If I ever transform my personal individual preference into a divine principle, then I start trying to force others to live by my convictions, and then what do I, come, I become? I become a Pharisee. I become a legalist. I, you know, I was raised, my dad, some of you may know, my dad was almost basically an alcoholic until he got saved when he was 28 years old. So I, I grew up being taught, you know, the evils of alcohol. And, even, you know, alcohol can be a dangerous thing, no question about that. But I'll be honest, I used to, I, used to, I was so, you know, so pharisaical that I, I'd walk in. If I saw somebody drinking a beer, I'd say, well, that guy needs to be saved. If I saw a guy drinking a glass of wine, well, he must not be right with God. And God convicted me of that. Because I realized, wait a minute, James, you're condemning things the Bible doesn't condemn. You're going beyond what God says. So one surefire, surefire sign you're a legalist, listen, one sure find you're a legalist is when you're always looking for what's wrong in someone else's life so you can judge them instead of looking for what's right in their life so you can encourage them. And I just made up my mind, I'm not going to be the kind of person in part A. I want to be the person in part B. Because if you do that, if you don't do that, then your hobby becomes nitpicking. Your hobby becomes judging. Your hobby becomes criticizing. And by the way, there's a flip, tie, flip side to this. Let me tell you something else. The way you can know if you're a legalist or the way you can know somebody else is a legalist. When you become a legalist, you always see the fault in others, but you rarely see the fault in yourself. You're great at spotting the stick in somebody's eye, but not the log in your own. So it doesn't matter whether you look down on people who drink or they don't wear a coat and a tie to church, or they have tattoos and nose rings, or they come to church in shorts and flip-flops. Whenever you start judging people, saying that's not right, that's wrong, shouldn't be that way, you're wrong, you're not right with God, you just fell into a legalism trap just like those Pharisees. Now, here's the point I want you to understand. The problem the Pharisees had was not that Jesus was healing anybody. They didn't have a problem with that. Their problem was, but you're doing it on the Sabbath. Well, why was that a problem? Now, listen, I, I, I've shared this with you before, I want to share it with you again. The Old Testament Sabbath law was very simple. Or the Bible is very plain. Six days set aside for work. On the seventh day, you rest. We all know that. But here's the problem. When you study the Old Testament, the Old Testament doesn't say a lot about what work is. So, for example, is it okay to cut your grass on Sunday? The Bible doesn't say is it okay when you get home to church, you've been meaning to paint that kitchen wall? Is it okay to paint your kitchen wall on Sunday? The Bible doesn't say. It doesn't again. It just says, you know, rest and work. Rest and work. So you work six days, you rest on the seventh day. Well, these religious leaders said, you know what? We're going to do what God didn't do. So they took it upon themselves to add an appendix to God's Word. You might say they amended God's law. They said, okay, we're going to define what work is. So over the years, they identified 39 different expressions of what they called work. So they managed to make what God intended to be a day of rest into a day of stress. And they placed so many rules and so many regulations and so many restrictions on this one simple commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, it actually became harder to rest on the Sabbath than it did the other days of the week. Because you are so afraid, am I doing something wrong? Am I doing something that I shouldn't do? And by the way, that's what every other religion in the world does. Do you realize that? Jesus said this. You remember what Jesus said? He said, come to me, all you are here who are weary and burdened, and I will give you, say that word real loud, rest. He said, if you'll come to me, I'll give you rest. He did not say, if you come to me, I'll give you more rules. I'll give you more regulations. I'll give you more restrictions. I'll give you more religion. He said, no, 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 no. If you come to me, I'll give you 
rest. Here's the difference between religion and Jesus. If you come to religion, here's what you'll get. Do's and don'ts. Do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. You come to Jesus, he said, I will give you rest. A great revivalist named Leonard Ravenhill said this. This is so good. He said, I'd rather have 10 people that want God than 10,000 people who want to play church. I have to tell you as a pastor, I have to be honest. I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I'm just asking a question. Did you come this morning to find God or play church? Just, it's, 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 I have to ask myself the same question. It's a legitimate question. You're watching online right now. Is it just, okay, you feel guilty if you don't? Are you really wanting to find God? Are you prioritizing religion over God? That's the first mistake. Here's the second mistake. Don't prioritize rules over goodness. Don't prioritize religion over God. Don't prioritize rules over goodness. Now, Jesus knows the Pharisees are watching. Man, he's not dumb. They're watching every move. So here's what he does. I love, I love Jesus. Jesus is my man. I love the way he approaches things. He doesn't pussyfoot around. He doesn't you know, go around the mountain. He gets right to the point. Listen to what he does. So Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Why did Jesus say that? He, wanted, he knew the disciples were watching, and since he knew they were going to get on to him anyway, he said, okay, let me just make sure you don't miss what I'm about to do. I just love, He was sticking it to him. I love Jesus. Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, brilliant move. He asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. You know what he's doing? He's actually going to the umpire before the game even starts. He says, okay, tell me what the rules are. I mean, it's brilliant. Before he even play the game, before the first pitch is even thrown, he asks the umpire for a ruling. And he, why did he do that? Because these umpires had a bunch of made-up rules. The gospel actually records, you know how many times that Jesus healed on the Sabbath day? You know how many times he did it? Seven times. Seven different Sabbath, Jesus healed. But evidently, the reason why they got upset and the reason why they thought he was breaking the rules is because he did it on the Sabbath. But here's the problem. Jesus was more interested in doing good than he was in following rules. And that's really what caused the problem between Jesus and these religious leaders because that's exactly what they had done. They had taken the Old Testament. Here's what they did. They had taken the Old Testament and they calculated the Old Testament has 248 commandments and 365 prohibitions. If you go through the Old Testament, and they're right. So in other words, you've got to, they said, okay, if you're going to really be close to God, you've got to perfectly keep every one of the 1,613 rules. Well, that's, that's hard enough. But they weren't satisfied. So to make sure they didn't break the rules, what do you think they did? They made up rules about the rules. Sound like good politicians, right? They made up rules about the rules. So they came up with more than 1,500 additions to these rules. And all of this oral tradition was gathered into what is known as called the Mishnah. If you've heard of the Mishnah, that's the book that is the rules about the rules. So you've got all these commandments in the Old Testament. This is the 1,500 additions they gave. This is the appendix. This is the addenda they gave to the law. But that wasn't enough. They said, you know what? We want to make sure that we keep the rules about the rules. So they made more rules about the rules to make sure you kept the rules. And they put that in a book called the Gemara. Because they want to make sure they didn't break any rules. So they put the Mishnah and the Gemara together, and that's where they came up with a book called the Talmud. So if you want to know what the Talmud is, that is a Jewish book that says, okay, you've got all of these rules in the Old Testament. Here are the rules to make sure you're keeping those rules, and here are the rules to make sure you're keeping the rules about the rules that you cannot break. Well, 39 of those rules had to do with what you could do and you could not do on the Sabbath. So let me give you some examples. You could not walk in a straight line on the Sabbath day more than 5.98 miles in any direction if you were outside the city limit. But they didn't have GPS back in that day. 
So how do you know when you walk 5.98 miles? And, but, and, but now, if you were within the city limit, you could walk all you wanted to in the city limit, but you go outside the city limit, can't walk more than 5.98 miles. Here's another rule. They said to properly follow the command to rest on the Sabbath and not work, they decided we need to figure out how many steps you can take on the Sabbath before it becomes work. So listen to this. They calculated that if you took more than 50 steps on the Sabbath, that was work and it violated the law. Here's another one. You could eat on the Sabbath, but you couldn't cook. Here's another one. You could bandage a wounded person, but you couldn't apply medicine. Here's another one. If you are a woman, listen to this, ladies, you could not look in the mirror. Why? You might see a gray hair. If you saw a gray hair, you might be tempted to pluck it out, and you just worked. I mean, I, listen, this is, can I tell you my favorite one? This is my favorite one. You couldn't carry a load heavier than a dried fig. Now, think about a dried fig. They said you can't pick up anything heavier than a dried fig, or you're working. But if it weighed half the amount of a dried fig, you could carry it twice. Oh, I'm not making this up. Now, Jesus knew. Here's a man with a withered hand. Okay, let's, 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 let's understand what's going on. Jesus knew that this man's life was not in danger. I mean, his, his withered hand could have wait, waited another day to be healed. So why did Jesus say, I'm going to stick it right to you guys. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you say. Stand up, son. I'm about to change your life. Because Jesus said, I don't care about rules. I just care about doing good. Because for Jesus, you never put rules over goodness. If you're a parent or a grandparent, that's a great lesson to teach your kids. That's a great lesson to teach your grandkids. Let me put it in a legal way today, in a more up-to-date way. You better teach your kids just because it's legal doesn't mean it's moral. So let me just make this plain. Abortion may be legal. It doesn't make it right. Period. End of discussion. No discussion. No, no, I get it. I'm not talking about the health of the mother and all that. I've told you before that the, the doctor almost had to abort me because my mother was about to die. And my, doc, my father told him if it came down to me or my mom, save the mom. He was exactly right. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in a general way. Just because it's legal doesn't make it moral. Don't put rules over goodness. And I'll be honest with you, this is a principle I wish people followed more every day. Listen, there is never a wrong time to do the right thing no matter what, the, what rule might be broken. There is never a wrong time to do the right thing no matter what rule might be broken. Let me give you an example. Our church, by necessity, because of who we are, we're, in, you know, we, we're incorporated, we have policies, and we have procedures. But I was just going to say something for the record. We never put policies above people. We never put procedures above people unless it's best for the people. It angers Jesus when you put rules over goodness. It angers Jesus when you prioritize religion over God. And then here's the last thing. Don't make this mistake. Don't put rituals over grace. Don't put rituals over grace. Now, Jesus is asking him a question. So is it lawful to do good or evil? Is lawful to do to kill a man or give a, give a man life, which is lawful. And he asked a, a good question, and they either couldn't answer or they wouldn't answer. I think they wouldn't answer because they knew they couldn't answer it. Because he knew deep down, they already knew what the answer was. So I want you to notice his response. Watch this. He looked around at them in, what's that word? Say it real loud. Did Jesus get angry? He got angry. Not a sin necessarily to get angry. Let's make that plain. He looked around them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. That word distressed, by the way, means indignant. Deeply distressed. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out. I'd love to have seen that. Wouldn't that have been cool? And the hand was completely restored. So why did Jesus become angry with these religious leaders? Why? But it all goes back to God's house and God's day and God's word and what God himself is all about. Let me tell you what God's all about. You want to tell you in one word what God's all about? Grace. That's what God's all about. 
He's all about grace. He's all about restoring those who have fallen, repairing that which is broken, refilling that which is empty. And what is so sad and what is so tragic is these, these religious leaders, listen, these religious leaders didn't care about this withered hand because they had such withered hearts. They didn't give any, they didn't care about that guy. All they cared about is our rules, our laws, our amendments, our regulations. See, they had certain rituals that you had to follow if you're going to be right with God. That, you know, it, it didn't matter whether you were right with God or not. You know, now in the 21st century, you say, well, well, we don't have rituals. Well, yeah, we do. We just changed the name. You know what we call it? We call it tradition. So we have tradition. Churches have tradition. Now, before I say what I'm about to say, I want to make something very plain. There is nothing wrong with tradition. I think some traditions are good. I think some traditions should never be broken. I, I think just as long as the tradition advances the gospel and doesn't hinder it, and as long as the tradition doesn't keep people from Jesus, and as long as the tradition doesn't contradict the Word of God, I think it's great. But I, I'll tell you, I've learned the hard way in churches I pastored. I've learned it. I, I pastored some country churches and rural churches, and I pastored smaller churches. And I want to tell you something. I learned early on. I'm going to say this in a crude way. I got my rear end handed to me a couple of times. You know why? Because I messed with a tradition. And I didn't realize it was such a sacred tradition. And what I found out about people who are all enamored with tradition is when you talk to them and you ask them, do you even know why you have this tradition? They can't even tell you. I, I love the story of a lady who always cut the ends of her ham, her, her ham off before she cooked it. She got by ham, and she cooked, she'd cut both ends off, and, and then she'd cook it. Well, when um, someone would ask her, why do you always cut the, ham, the ends of the ham off before you cook it? She'd always say, well, that's what mom always did. It's just what mom always did. So she got to thinking about it. one day, she called her mom. And she said, Mom, I want to ask you a question. She said, why do you cut the ends off of your ham before you cook it? And she said, well, that's just what my mom did. Well, they said, well, why don't we call Grandma and see why she did it? So they got on the phone with Grandma. They said, Grandma, I just want to ask you a question. Why do you always cut the ends off your ham? She said, because that's the only way I can get it to fit in my pan. <laughs> now, let me give you a great example. Let me give you a great example. We worship, our letter worship service is at 11 o'clock. Ever since I've gone to church, I've gone, you, know, you go to 11 o'clock service, that's the later service. I've heard of churches that just had civil war because the church went from 11 o'clock to 1030. Or some have gone from 11 o'clock to 1050. And people just get all upset about it. Some of you may know this, I bet most of you don't. Do you know why churches have services at 11 o'clock? How many of you know the answer to that question? Okay, very few. Do you know why churches have services at 11 o'clock? I'm not making this up. You can go study it for yourself. Because back in the days, farmers had to have time to milk their cows so they couldn't go to church too early. So churches started service at 11 o'clock. So what am I saying? If you don't own a cow, you shouldn't worry about what's 11 o'clock or not. What do you care? doesn't matter. But, I mean, there are some churches that think 11 o'clock is set in the United States Constitution. So, you've got this man, withered hand, needs to be healed. There's nothing in the text that says Jesus was obligated to heal the man. There's nothing in the text that says the man deserved to be healed. There was nothing in the text that said Jesus was offered to pay, offered money to heal the man. This man just needed grace. And even though Jesus literally did not lift a hand to heal the hand, listen, think about that. All the man did was stretch his hand out. Jesus never did a thing. He just looked at him. But even though he did not heal, heal, lift a hand to heal the hand, because of their religion and because of their rules and because of their rituals and because of their restrictions and because of their sacred traditions, they didn't want grace to take place. So now we're going to get down to the brass tacks and finish. Now you see the difference between, if you don't know this, those of you who are watching right now, if you don't understand the difference between religion and Christianity, I'm about to give it to you. Religion is about what others want from you. Christianity is about what God wants for you. You can believe this or not. My primary goal for you is not what I can get out of you. 
It's what God can give to you. You see, I know what I'm doing. Because if God gives you what he needs to give you, we'll get from you what we need from you. But too many churches and pastors flip it. We're going to see this in a couple of weeks. Because religion's all about rules and requirements and regulations and rituals and restrictions. Christianity is simply about a relationship with Jesus who's all about goodness and all about grace. So Mark records this remarkable sentence that almost takes your breath away. Watch this. I mean, this is unbelievable. Listen to this. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Are you ripping kidding me? That's the best you got? Jesus heals a withered hand, and now you want to kill Jesus? Remember, it's not what Jesus did that got them most upset. It is when he did it. As a matter of fact, John in his gospel records it this way. Listen to this. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. You're not a man of God. You're up there preaching. Don't even have a tie on. You can't be a Christian. Get that nose ring out of your nose. What are you coming in here with that purple hair and those flip-flops? What do you even mean? This man's not from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others ask, how can a, a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Let me ask you a question. Doesn't that just, doesn't that just, doesn't that just make you fall in love with religion and rules and rituals and regulations and restrictions? I mean, here's what's so ironic. So let me get this straight. I'm talking to you, Mr. Pharisee. You can't heal on the Sabbath, but it's okay on the Sabbath to go out and hire a hit man. Is that the way it works? I mean, it's against the rules to heal a withered hand, but it's not against the rules to plot how to kill the man who healed the withered hand. You know what's amazing? When you put Jesus in his proper place, when you see Jesus with a proper perspective, here's what you, I guarantee you, you'll never do this. When you put Jesus where Jesus belongs and you see Jesus the way you ought to see him, you will never let a major become a minor and you'll never let a minor become a major. You always keep things in order. So I want to close with this. I love this true story. There was a, a, a British minister and he recounted an imaginary conversation between an early Christian and her Roman neighbor, her next door Roman neighbor, who was a pagan. Here's the conversation. The pagan neighbor said, I hear you are religious. Religion is a good thing. Where is your temple? The Christian replied, we don't have a temple. Jesus is our temple. The Romans said, no temple? Where do your priests work and where do they do their rituals? The Christian replied, we don't have priests. Jesus is our priest. The Romans said, no priest? Then where do you offer your sacrifices so that your God will favor you? The Christian replied, we don't need a sacrifice. Jesus is our sacrifice. And it's because of what he's done for us, not what we do for him, that we already have God's favor. The pagan neighbor finally sputtered, what kind of religion is this? To which the neighbor, the Christian said, it is not a religion at all. So I want to say this to a lost world out there. I don't mean to be offensive. I don't mean to be unkind. I don't mean to sound arrogant. You keep your religion. You keep your rules. You keep your regulations. You keep your restrictions. You keep your rituals. Just give me Jesus. Would you pray with me right now with heads bowed and with eyes closed? I want to say just a quick word to those who are watching and those in this room right now. Let me ask you a question. I wonder how many of you listening to me right now have made that big mistake. You've got religion, but you don't have God. You keep the rules, but not a lot of goodness. You got all the, you got all the restrictions and regulations now, but no grace. I just want to share with you again. Religion is not the way to Jesus. You'll never get to Jesus. You'll never get to God by religion, by your rules, by your right. You will never get there. The only bridge to God is Jesus. And it's paved with grace 
and goodness. And if today you would like to drop your religion and pick up a relationship, if today you would like to get out of that legalistic mode you've been in and quit being the judge of the universe and realize that you too need a Savior who died for your sins, who came back from the grave to deliver you from your rules and regulations and restrictions and religion and all of that stuff that means nothing, then would you just tell him this right now? Would you just say something like this? Dear God, I now realize my rule keeping, my religion, all my goodness means nothing. I need your grace. I don't have a withered hand. I do have a withered heart. Lord Jesus, believing you died for me and believing that you came back from the grave right now, I want you to come into my heart. I want you to restore me. I want you to heal me spiritually. I want you to save me. Forgive me of my sins. I receive your gift of eternal life. I repent and turn away from everything I've ever tried except you, Lord Jesus. And today, I give you my life. If you're in this building right now or you're listening online right now and you prayed that prayer with me and you meant that prayer with me, I want you to do something right now, right now, where you are at home. Get on your computer, get on your cell phone, get on your iPad. I want you to go to one, do one of these two things. I want you to go to crosspointchurch.com forward slash decision. Do it right now. Or just text yes Jesus to 56525. That's it. All you got to do right now, if you prayed that prayer, if you made a decision to give your life to Christ, do that right now. Here's what will happen. You'll go to a site. And we'll tell you at that point, okay, here's the steps you need to take. And we're going to help you take those steps to become a real follower, become a true follower of God. We're going to send you information. We're going to send you material. We're going to help you get started in your walk with the Lord. You may, have, uh, you may not have gotten to see or got to witness, or maybe you did. We baptized a, a, a wonderful young man today that grew up in Ukraine. He grew up in an orphanage, came to America. He got saved. He was biblically baptized because that's his way of saying yes to Jesus. You may say, I've trusted Christ. I've been saved saved, but I've never, ever followed Christ in baptism. If you'd like to do that, just text that or go to that website. If you'd like to join our church, if you'd say, you know, I've been coming here for, I'd like to be a part of this church. Either way, any decision you want to make, you can do it here. If you're in the building and you've got a problem you're going through or you want to let us know about your decision today, when you go out to our lobby, there's a church, there's a table called Connection Point. Just go to that table. That's all you got to do. Go to that table. And there'll be someone there that will help you and talk with you and they'll love you and pray for you. If you're going through a spiritual difficulty, we want to do that. So all that said, what I said today, I'm preaching to the choir. There's a world out there that needs to hear what we said today. There are people out there that you know and they think they've got it all together because they go to church, they've been baptized, they do the ritual, they do this, they do that. They don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't do this. And they don't realize they're lost. They need grace. They need the Christ, the only one that can heal not just their withered life, but their withered heart. And that's why we say every week before you leave, you're sent. You're sent to your one. You're sent to that one that God will bring across your path this week to say to them, can I give you some great news today? I'm going to offer you the greatest gift you'll ever receive, the grace of God. So we're going to close with a worship song before we leave. So I want you to stand to your feet. And I want to thank you for being here today. And let's end this day giving glory to the God that heals withered hands and withered hearts.
Amen, amen. Real quick, my name is Riley. I'm the high school pastor here. And a few things before we are sent out. One, if you did not know, this morning we began kind of our new phase of reopening and we actually opened up our preschool ministry. So real quick, here's a few pictures of what happened uh, this morning in our preschool area. There's some of them getting checked in there this morning. And uh, they had their own little islands they sat on during Butterfly Island. They were cleaning the toys left and right, trying to keep the kids apart, doing everything we can to keep these preschoolers safe, as well as you might have a preschooler in, in the room. And it was kind of hard to corral them and control them. And so now opportunity for them in the morning. A second thing we have going on for you all uh, this afternoon is uh, this afternoon, our next gen ministries, our preschool kids and student ministries are hosting a corn maze takeover. So this afternoon from two to four o'clock at the Buford Corn Maze, it's Cross Point Day. So if you show up, you mentioned mention Cross Point Church, you get a discount, it's only $12 a person. We'll have a tent up there, come hang out, uh, do the corn maze, the activities, an opportunity for us to fellowship. And maybe you have a kid who had too much sugar last night and they need to burn it off, okay? Or maybe you ate too much candy while handing it out and you need to burn off some extra calories. We'd love for you to come to join us and just hang out and fellowship as a church outside. And the beautiful weather, it's gonna be 64 degrees sunny. It's going to be nice. The fog's gone. We'd love to see you all there. And at the end of the day, remember, as we go into this election, as Doc said, don't make the political personal. And as we just sang, Jesus is at the center of it all. We love you, church. You are sent.